Tyler, once again, thanks for joining us here on Whispering Hope. We are so glad that you've been with us since the beginning of the week. It's Tuesday today, and we're delighted to be in your company once again. We're going to be looking at the Word of God as it is being brought to us in the format of the Adult Bible Study Guide. Uh, this week, as always, we have our faithful two panelists here to help us to understand and to bring some insights into the lesson for today. And so I'm going to go ahead and welcome them. You know them very well, but just perchance you are here on Whispering Hope for the very first time, I introduce to you, first of all, the lovely Jacqueline Gordon. Elder Gordon, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy as usual to be here. And indeed, the Holy Spirit, you know, elders, we really must depend on the Holy Spirit as we dive into the Word of God. So indeed, the Holy Spirit is going to bless all of us today. Welcome again. Welcome one. Welcome all. Amen. Nice to have you with us, Elder Gordon. And my good old friend, Elder Andy David. Elder David, how things going for the week so far? Well, good morning, good morning. Um, not bad so far, nothing to complain about. Just that um, the days sometimes need a few more hours so that I can accomplish what I need to accomplish. But I am thankful to God for what he has enabled me to accomplish during the week. More so that I am here alive and in relatively good health. So good morning and welcome to those who are here. I trust that we'll have a fantastic time again today. All right, welcome. Elder David, please be reminded that the Bible says, lest the days are shortened, the very left could not be saved. So give thanks that the days are shortened. Uh, but I know what you mean. The folks are watching with us. We're streaming through these quarters as far as I can see. As soon as you blink, you're at the end of another quarter. And we just try to take the time out here on Whispering Hope to pause a moment and look at the lesson a little bit more in depth. And perhaps we can have some questions that would help all of us to think and to study a little bit more. But for today, we're going to commence. But before we do so, we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to ask Elder Andy David to give us that prayer that we need from the Holy Spirit to guide us in our study for today. And then right after the prayer, Elder God will bring forth our memory text and we'll move on from there. Elder David, go right ahead. And so loving, Lord, again, we are so very grateful for the way you have been with us, been with, with us in our past studies here on this platform. For the way of guidance, for the insights that we would have gleaned. And dear God, as we have come today again, we depend on your Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us. Open our minds, open our understanding. And grant, dear God, that we'll see your will. And as we see your, your will today, may we, may we be willing to follow wherever you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen again. Our memory text for this week is taken from Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, reading from the New King James Version, and it reads, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon, for reading our memory text, and for Elder David for that prayer. Now we're looking this week, the lesson title is A City Called Confusion. A City Called Confusion. That immediately evokes certain thoughts into my head. I don't know about you elders or the viewing audience, but the, A City Called Confusion. And Elder Gordon, as you would have read the memory text taken from the book of Revelation, nonetheless, Revelation 17, 14. Um, do you see any connection? I hope there is. Or what is the connection, I should ask, between the memory text and the title? I know the title is not wholly inspired, but in context of things, there should be some connection. So can you bridge that connection for us in terms of the memory text and the title for this week? What I see coming out here, when we hear about war, these will make war. Who are these? And we're talking about Babylon or confusion or defiancy from God or the kings of the earth, those who seek to be a part of a system that intentionally goes against the will, the command, the dictate of God. So it's bad enough to make war, but to be in total defiance against the will of God, to actually trample on the truth of God and to destroy, seek rather, to destroy those who are upholding the scandal of God. This is what we see here. But I'm thankful for the last line that says, though the beast's power will make war 
with the saints, with those who choose to walk with God, it says that Jesus will overcome them. And if we are in Jesus and we remain in Jesus in spite of what the beast power will do to us we are we will be overcomers when we hold on to the nail scarred hand of Jesus why because he's king of kings and the lord of lords amen amen he's king of kings you know there are many kings who have ruled this this earth in terms of their kingdoms but God Almighty is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Elder David, anything to add in terms of the, the memory text understanding today? Elder God would have covered it, yes. The, we are part of the, this great big controversy. The devil and his followers are going to seek to overcome this world. I mean, the devil knows that he can, but he will seek to deceive all those who are following him into thinking that they can overcome the Lamb. But the Lamb would have already overcome, having gone to the cross. All right, So it behoves us to really accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and serve him so that indeed we will come out on the right side of this great controversy. Because the Bible tells us in the memory text, yes, they will try to deceive, to defeat him, but the Lamb will overcome. Let us be a part of the overcoming team. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elder David. Now we get to choose this lesson, and the title of the lesson is Mystery. And the great, there's a comma after mystery, and that, that's taken from the scripture. Mystery, Babylon the great. We know that the revelation has symbolically two women, or it's symbolized with two women. One, one, one is representing the pure church of Christ, and the other one is representing that other church, that confusion, that apostate state of religion. And so Tuesday's lesson is now talking about mystery, Babylon the great. And this, as we go forward, elders, it's going to be revealing to us something that all of our viewers, I believe, will be able to appreciate, perhaps some more than others, about what this particular uh, quotation, because it is a quotation, the title of Choose This Lesson, from the Word of God means. So, as I've said before, there are two symbolic women in Revelation. And one represents the pure church of Christ, one represents the other church, the apostate false church. So let's begin, elders, by looking on the Tuesday for the text, I'm going to ask Elder Gordon to read this for us. Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to read the verses 4, 5, and 6. Those three verses in Revelation 17, verses 4 to 6. And then the question is for you, Elder Gordon, what do these verses teach us about the nature of this evil system? So obviously we're looking at some evil system here, and the text is going to bring it out for us. So let's go with Revelation 17, 4 to 6. Revelation 17, 4 to six, reading from the King James Version. And the Bible says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stone and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Well, what we see coming out here, as you rightfully set the premise, that Revelation speaks of two women and today for Tuesday's lesson we're focusing on the woman arrayed in scarlet colors and I saw a mirror and I believe this is mirrors what happened in Genesis chapter one you notice when the serpent deceived Eve he went to that tree that forbidden tree that fruit and and some Bible commentators said that it was glittering, it, it, it was appealing to Eve's eye, and sin entered the world because of disobedience. We see, we see almost the same precedent is being set with this woman. Why? She is decked in colorful red and scarlet, golds, precious stone, as uh, almost to allure someone to her attention. But then, in the cup, she has a golden cup in her hand, full of what? Abomination, filthiness, 
and fornication. And in this context, the word fornication is used here as false doctrine. When those would have drunk of what she has, what characterizes the false church it is the false doctrine that would have been ingested ingested and so it becomes a part of them hence we are seeing the the level of tolerance the level of defiance that we're seeing against the word of god so yes this mysterious woman the woman dressed in the scarlet colors first she is in that attractive color because she wants to win attraction and once she will have won the attraction, then she would have fed them or ingested in them the false doctrine to the point where they stood and are defiant to the word of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. Elder David, I have another question for you, but do you want to add anything to what Elder Gordon would have said concerning that particular passage of scripture and about the question that I asked? Yes, I would like to comment on a part of this scripture, a part of that passage, the one that says, the name written on her forehead was mystery, Babylon the Great. The name written on her forehead, and the name that was written over there was Babylon the Great. It sort of symbolized the fact that it's written on her head, her forehead, is not literally, but it sort of symbolizes or signifies the thinking of the woman. The kind of philosophy behind this woman, which you say represents a church. Now, and to get what that is, we might want to go back a bit to where Babylon first existed. And that is with the Tower of Babel. When God said, look, he will not destroy the earth by water again, but with fire. But they stood in defiance of that. They started to build this tower. It was not of God. As a matter of fact, it was in direct opposition to what God said. So it was a man-made thing. So that gives us an idea of the sort of thinking that is within this religious system, uh, this impure church, which the woman not with the scarlet thing represents. And we also see in Daniel, I think it's in chapter 4 and verse 30, when Daniel stepped out. And he said, look, he looked at that Babylon. Isn't it this great Babylon which I built? So it sort of signifies a religious system that is built not on God's word, but on human effort, human traditions. So that is what I gleaned from that text. The thing written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, sort of signifies the kind of thinking, the kind of principles that drives this system. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that, Elder. David, you actually peeked at my question because you opened the door. So we're going to go through the door now. We're going to go, and I'm going to ask you to read Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 4 and the verse 9. So Genesis 11, verses 1 to 4 and the verse 9. And we're going to see exactly about this, this thing that you spoke about being written on the head of that apostate woman talking about Babylon the Great. Let's see what the Word of God tells us in Genesis 11, 1 to 4 and verse 9. Genesis 11, 1 to 4, reading from the New International Version, the Bible says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in China and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come. Let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. <laughs> Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And he says, that is why it was called Babel, because there, was, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, okay. the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Excellent. Thank you, Elder David. So for, it was called Babel because there was confusion. The New King James Version said the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And um, I'm coming to you, Elder Gordon. Uh, thanks for reading for those texts for Elder David. Elder Gordon, uh, we, we see here very specifically because we're going back to the Babylon of the Old Testament. 
to come forward where we are now in Revelation with this apostate person, with a, 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 as Elder David says, the way of the, the thought process or the way of thinking of this system is that of the Old Testament and the Old Babylon. And we see now in Genesis here where Babel came from or Babel came from, the Tower of Babel was built. Tell us a little bit, Elder Gordon, about, I mean, Elder David touched on it, but if you want to just expand upon it. The question I have is mankind versus spiritual. Man tried to devise ways and means of, of, of doing great things, trying to usurp God. What do we see in the parallelism, if there is any parallelism, between Genesis 11 and Revelation 17, 4 about Babylon and the whole apostate religious state? Is it something of God or is it something of man? Man-made religion. And let us, I think Elder David did an excellent point to set the foundation. But just to build on that, let me just reflect back. We are looking at Genesis chapter 11. But I need to go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, where after the flood, we see God asking Noah, taking Noah and his family and the entire animal kingdom out of the boat. And he said to them in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, the Bible says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. After he would have established that, he already said to them, spread out, be fruitful, replenish the earth. So God's first instruction was to spread out, replenish the earth, be fruitful, and multiply. God went further to establish his covenant of that flood, to say to them that he would not destroy the entire earth by flood again. He said that to Noah. And what was so peculiar about this message, this covenant, is that it even referred to the very animals. He will not do it again. That's God's word. And in order to establish that covenant, God said to Noah, whenever it rains, whenever he sets the cloud, he's going to place a rainbow. That rainbow is his covenantal contract to remind him that water will never destroy the earth again. That's God's foundation. What we see happening is that the children, Noah's descendants, they gather on Shania, farm of Babylon, and what did they do? So we see Satan's word coming out again. Exactly what they said is what Satan said. Remember in Isaiah, when Satan said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High. I will set my throne above God's throne. And so we see the children of Babylon, the children of Noah's descendants now, building this tower. And if you notice, they use the martyr, and the Bible said that they said they're going to bake it properly. In other words, it must be waterproof. In other words, they did not rely on God's word. They wanted to remove from God's commandment and there's being defiant to God to say, listen, the next time a flood comes, we are going to be right up. The tower is going to reach unto heaven. It's going to be waterproof. So when God sent another flood, we will be protected. Now, what they established that that's Satan's doctrine. That's man-made doctrine. God said not to do it but satan crept in their minds again and which mirrors the babylon the woman babylon written on her head confusion it's in the mind and so they execute their thinking by erecting a tower that will reach heaven because they did not believe or they choose not to believe that god will never wipe them out by flood again excellent thank you elder gordon now so we're looking here at um these thought processes that we can attain a saving situation by ourselves on our own. The people who build the Tower of Babel were trying to build something, as you said, Elder Gordon, that is going to protect that, that's going to keep them from any other such devastation that the Lord may want to do. They're going to save themselves. And so, Elder David, I'm coming to you know that we look at from Old Testament time, coming forward now in this postmodern world, has anything changed in terms of? Man trying to save himself 
rather than looking to God to save us? Has anything changed or is it the case where the more things change, the more they remain the same? Or has it gone worse? Okay, look what. I'm going to link a little bit in Genesis 11 and verse 4. The last part of it says, and we said, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that, and this is the part, so that we may make a name for ourselves. So that we may make a name for ourselves. Now, their actions were based on selfish motives it was filled with selfish motives they wanted to build something that they will get the glory for now i want to go to nebuchadnezzar for a little bit too said so nebuchadnezzar he sat in the temple as god as one who represents god and as though when he spoke he spoke for god now in this world, we know of the great controversy, and there are only two sides. Either we are on God's side or on the devil's side. So anyone who is seeking to make a name for him or herself, or any institution that is seeking a name for itself, you have to come to the conclusion that in this great controversy, that institution, that person, or those persons, are on the devil's side. Now, Nebuchadnezzar sat in the temple as one, as God, and as one speaking for God. You ask me about today, is there a religious system? Is there a person who is operating similar to Nebuchadnezzar? Who claim to speak for God? Who claim to sit in the, in the seat of God? Yes, and if you examine that system, you will see that salvation is not based on Christ dying, but on tradition, which that system would have established. When one does that, one takes away the credit from God. And we must understand here too that the ultimate issue here is worship. All right, They seek to covet that worship by coveting the place of God. So yes, what happened in ancient Babylon? This self-righteousness depending on humanism, rather than depending on Jesus and the blood of Jesus for salvation, we see today a system that, that promotes tradition above the word of God. All right, thank you for that. We're going to follow up with a question to Elder Gordon uh, from what Elder David would have said. Elder Gordon, here's a question. We have many faith-based groups around the world. We have many denominations of Christianity. We have some which are of different religions. Let me ask a question, a personal question. Coming home to your home, your home-based faith group, uh, is there a danger? Is there a possibility that making a name for itself around the world as a prominent movement, the last day people of God, is there a danger in, in doing that, making a name for themselves? And do we also run the risk of depending upon the, the quote-unquote traditions of this faith movement? Uh, for salvation. Yes, and as we have established in the past that we are dealing here with a system and not people, because we know the Bible says that God has his people all over different religion, and they're going to hear his voice. The Bible said that the shepherd, the sheep knows the voice of the shepherd, and when they hear his voice, they will follow him. But the angel, the second angel message crying, Babylon is falling. It has that great mystery, that great pop of indignation. And we are already established that it at once we would have, that's why there's a song that says, careful little eyes what you see, ears what you hear. Because once we would have heard, once we would have ingested, process it, and we live it out, we act it out, then it becomes a part of us. Now, back to the system as you're making claim. There's a system that has destroyed the people of God and attempt to destroy God's people. And this system, you know, comes from Satan himself. So as we go back to Revelation and dealing with the woman, the harlot, that had that cup of indignation and that cup committed a fornication 
with the rest of the earth. We are basically seeing here that the system seek to change times and laws. The system seeks to reintroduce man-made doctrines. And we have an example of them as you talk about the relevancy of today. We have an example of them. We have, they call it the baptism of baby. And we know the Bible says, when you repent and you're baptized, you shall be saved. We know a baby is not of that level of maturity to repent. But then it is the sprinkling that is introduced. We studied some time about purgatory, the state of the dead. That's a man-made religion again came from again when Satan told Eve, you shall not surely die. And so this institution has instituted as a part of the doctrine, the, 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 what, what do I call it? The tale of purgatory that he kept on what Satan says, you shall not surely die. Live how you please. Do as you please. Thus pay allegiance to the woman in scarlet colors. Because when death comes, you will not really surely die. You'll go to a place where you'll be purified and whatever else happens there. Man-made doctrines. And we see so many of them. But as Elder David made the point, the one problem he has, and that is worship. So what has the system done with worship and the Sabbath day to be more specific? It, it is all over. We can Google the information all over. And I would like to read something here. It's taken from the Roman Catechism, and it read by Priest Brady in an address reported in the Elizabeth and taken from news on March 18, March 18, 1903. And it says... It is well to be reminded, the Presbyterian, the Baptist, the Methodist, and all other Christians, that the Bible does not support them anywhere in the observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the church, or in other words, of man. As we are saying here again, we are not attacking people. It is the system. It is the woman dressed in scarlet colors. And what they have done, it is also stated that anyone can find the information is right there in the Catechism, where it is said, who changed the Sabbath day? And it says that they identified that Constantine changed the Sabbath day. The change of solemnity from the Sabbath, which is Saturday, to that of Sunday. So as we look at what this indignation, the abomination that is within the cup that the woman holds in her hand, where those who partake are drunken, in other words, they kind of, the thought process is no longer on the truth of God, but on the falsehood that Satan introduced and today, a lot are still holding on to that, to the error. Thank you, Elder Gordon, for that. And Elder David, I know you're part of a faith-based group, and we all are. The Bible clearly, in Revelation, as we're studying for today, clearly delineates or shows that dichotomy, that division between God's church and the apostate church. There is no mistake about it. The Bible speaks about it and about the characteristics and so on. And we know, as Elder Gordon quite aptly spoke about some of the basic or some of the very simple character traits of this apostate church situation, this woman that is dressed in scarlet and so on and so forth. But the question for you, Elder David, and as you give, after you give your answer, just give us your summary for today because we're coming to a close. The question I want to ask you is, do we run the risk or do you, Elder David, in your faith-based group, do you run the risk or does the, the faith-based group run the risk of depending upon let's say, any sort of tradition, uh, any sort of a name for themselves, that they may begin to slide a little bit and maybe look less at God and look more at the institution for salvation? That's my question to you. And you could give your summary at the end of that. Yes, we, we definitely run the risk. because, And that is why we have to always remind ourselves. We have to keep reminding ourselves that salvation comes through no other name but through the name of Jesus. And if we really pay attention to our institution and, and the things we espouse, the Sabbath being 
the chief one of them, that same institution, the same Sabbath institution, should serve to remind us of that also. Because the Bible, this, well, if we look at the Sabbath, the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. As we see in Exodus chapter 8, verses 11, it says, Because in six days he created all these things, we should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But when you look at Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, he told the Israelites that you should observe this day because I rescued you from Egyptian bondage. I rescued you from slavery. And the freedom from Egyptian bondage is symbolic of freedom from the bondage of sin. So even this Sabbath that we espouse and that we talk about so much should remind us that salvation is through Jesus. Because the Sabbath also is a reminder, not only that he is uh, our creator, but that he is our redeemer. And as I go, Revelation talks about two systems. I would like to read it just as it is here in, in the quote. It says, the first reveals a total trust in Jesus and dependence on his word. The second reveals trust in human authority and dependence of human, on human religious teachers. One is Christ-centered with faith, with total faith, dependence on Christ's grace, sacrifice and atonement for salvation. The other is a humanistic approach to faith that replaces the total dependence on Christ for salvation with the dependence on tradition, the traditions of the church. So let us ensure that we embrace the system, the church that trusts and depends on Jesus and the cross, his bloodshed on the cross for salvation, and not on the system that espouses tradition and depends on tradition for salvation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elder David. Let me come to you, Elder Gordon. Just a brief takeaway for today, today's lesson. And you know, this can happen to any one of us because I too been through that system. I've been there, I walked there, I, I, I went through the whole thing. And when I saw truth, when I heard truth for the first time, I thank God, I ran to it. So, you know, we were some who were socialized, they were baptized as a baby, and you really hold on to those doctrines. So we're, we're just imploring and appealing that, listen, we all recognize that we are at the end. I am telling you, when we look at that world crisis, when we look around at inflation, when we look around at what is happening in our society today, the amount of sicknesses, the amount of diseases, people are just dying. There's so many things happening. I think even the very animals recognize that something is about to happen. Well, that something is to, this is what, we're discussing is that Christ is about to make his appearance. The feet of the final kingdom will be crushed with a stone cut out without hands, and the next appearance will be that of Jesus. It may be difficult to accept right now, but the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I think we have come to the time where we must recognize that the world is crumbling. The world has has no hope. The only hope is in Jesus. And I would like to close by reading from the teacher's comments in our quarterly page 110, the final paragraph. And it says, I'll close with this. Once again, at the time of the end, God's people will be afflicted and persecuted by a religious oppressor called Babylon the Great. The book of Revelation Nation predicts that at a time of social chaos, political crises, natural disasters, and economic collapse, Jesus will return to triumph over the oppressive powers of the oppressive powers of the world and liberate his people. Praise the Lord. He will reign eternally. He will establish his throne securely in the universe forever. In the battle for the throne. He will be the victor. His people will journey with him to limitless space to worship in the new Jerusalem. Something is about to happen. And that something is Jesus is about to set up his kingdom. Don't you, 
Don't you want to be a part of such a kingdom? Accept Jesus by faith. Amen, amen. You certainly want to thank Elder Jacqueline Gordon and Elder Andy David once again for being with us here on the Spring Hope, folks. Mystery, Babylon the Great. At the end of time, God is calling us out of her, out of Babylon. Because it has its tentacles all across the whole globe. And so in every wind of doctrine, every institution of faith, Babylon is spreading its wings and its tentacles in those places. So we've got to be so mindful. We've got to be careful. Even within our own faith group, we've got to be very careful that we are not embracing these things of Babylon. Because God is calling us out, calling people out to come into his faithful and true and pure church. Leave the woman that is dressed in all those gab, all those red and, and jewelry and, and all those different things and all those different trappings externally and coming to the pure church, the pure church of God. So as we leave today, we pray that you continue to give yourself to the Lord. Thank you for continuing to support Whispering Hope. And as we continue to study, may God bless you. May you continue to grow in him until that day when we all shall be perfected. Have a blessed day. God bless you.